thank you thank you dr seema and let me first of all congratulate dr dr rajiv chawla sir and dr shalini for organizing this scientific feast and it's been already a, a grand success i said and, and the choice of topics sir to say the least is is very very you know <coughs> thought provoking so let me let me start sharing my slides so i'll start with the, you know we are, we are moving on from uh, nash to uh, to something very related which is the diabetic dyslipidemia and we'll be talking about the the current recommendations in in this uh, management of this this disease so this is the this shows us you know the various various components that uh, diabetes slash ascbd or dyslipidemia they are all interrelated you know see so dyslipidemia being at the center you have you have the complications in the form of stroke and coronary artery disease with hypertension and obesity being surrounded and <clears throat> and all these you know these this dyslipidemia hyperglycemia they work as as a fertilizer for this uh, this poisonous plant of coronary vascular disease that we that we that we get in a in a due course of time so if we talk particularly uh, of morbidity and mortality in diabetes we are all very well versed about the fact that more than 50% of the morbidity and almost to an extent of 60 65% is being attributed to coronary heart disease or or cerebrovascular accidents in all the vascular injuries or the vascular disease contributes to major chunk of morbidity and mortality from from this disease and that was the reason that when we were uh, graduating from our medical college so this was a very very a uh, common term that diabetes was put as a chd risk equivalent which meant what that if we put the patients in these four categories that the patient who has no diabetes no mi patient who has no diabetes but he had a uh, uh, cardiovascular event plus a patient with a diabetes but he has he has had no uh, cardiovascular event so what we see is that the patients those who do not have diabetes but had one episode of of myocardial infarction they almost had similar incidence of second episode of myocardial infarction as the patients those who have diabetes but had no previous history of ascbd or any vascular event so such was the scheme of things but as we know i mean diabetes is 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 again a very very you know it's broad spectrum disease depending on so many things the duration of the disease the comorbid factor eventually there was a and this was the paper which came out in jama and this they they had this canadian population study and what they concluded was that what was so apparent in 1994 that it is chd equivalent not so the case by 2014 and one of the main reasons in that being because because of the better control of hyperglycemia of course but along with it we are addressing this this uh, disease multifactorial approach now we are addressing the hypertension we are addressing dyslipidemia which are very important components of reducing the cardiovascular morbidity in these patients so with dyslipidemia management in that sense becomes a very vital part once we are talking about reducing the morbidity and uh, mortality from this disease called diabetes and when we talk about diabetes and dyslipidemia so there are few things which are which are little peculiar here so if we take type 1 uh, to what surprising is that type 1 uh, population is almost you know the glycemic control if their uh, a1c is well maintained so their lipid profile is almost as good as the normal population as con- as as what we call as the control population but in case of type 2 diabetes even with a decent control there are few peculiarities there one is that there is increased triglycerides increased vldl and idl which are again rich in triglycerides and a non hdl cholesterol component also goes up simultaneously there is a decrease in the protective uh, 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 hdl uh, protective uh, uh, lipid which is the hdl cholesterol which comes down and ldl cholesterol though numerically remains normal but we know that there is there is increase in the small dense ldl which is lot more atherogenic than the normal ldl and if we talk about the poor control so then again the triglycerides they are further accentuated vldl ild idl again go up and there is further drop in the protective cholesterol which is the hdl1 but here again <clears throat> where the ldlc which was almost normal in normal uh, in well controlled diabetes 
so there is a modest increase in ldl cholesterol and there is further increase in small dense ldl particles there are few things more which are again very interesting when we talk about about the lipid abnormalities in these patients one is that normally there is we know that there is trans um, there is postprandial upsurge in the plasma triglyceride levels now this postprandial increase in serum triglyceride levels is quite accentuated in these patients who have type 2 diabetes second is hdl do numerically might be little low but actually it is not fully it is not fully reflecting the overall risk of cvd in these patients uh, the hdl which has normally has antioxidant and anti inflammatory properties these anti uh, when this hdl isolate is isolated from these patients so these antioxidant and anti inflammatory properties they are reduced to a great extent in this population along with it the ability of the hdl to efflux cholesterol is also reduced so overall the hdl is low and it's perturbed as well so it's not a normal hdl that we see in these patients so this is again the slide depicting the mechanism so one of the main the key reasons being that there is there is increased output of vldl from the liver which again being because of the increased supply of free fatty acids to the liver free fatty acids coming again from the increased adipose tissue mass as well as there is decreased insulin activity so there is incre <coughs> um, increased conversion of triglycerides into free fatty acids in the adipose tissue secondly the free fatty acids are de facto also uh, in, you know increased uh, by the liver uh, it, it it there is uh, increased production per se by the liver of of uh, fatty acids and this is because the the though there is insulin resistance to the uh, to the carbohydrate metabolism but to the lipid synthesis the liver is liver is remain sensitive it's not resistant even in type 2 diabetics so there is increased uh, production of of, of uh, these uh, uh, uh triglycerides or sorry fatty acids which in turn leads on to increased production of triglycerides and this in turn leads on to increased outpouring of the vldl from the liver this vldl uh, which is with along with the chylomicrons which are rich in triglycerides so ctp uh, which is the enzyme this gets activated and there is there is increased conversion or increased transfer of triglycerides from vldl uh, as well as chylomicrons to hdl and ldl and these this transfer of triglycerides to hdl leads uh, along with the ldl it leads to increased hydrolysis of triglycerides and and leads to the production of hdl cholesterol along with the oh sorry as it uh, leads to the production of small dense ldl and small hdl as well and then this for the uh, explains the increased production of triglycerides or increased value of triglycerides along with the small dense ldl particles that we see in these patients so how do we manage these patients uh, we will we'll come to the drugs and first of all and fo foremost as in diabetes again lifestyle ch changes are uh, are you know uh, are the are the first things which need to be addressed and there is hardly any debate regarding the exercise part uh, almost every 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 organization agrees that there is has to be minimum of about 150 minutes of walk per, per week which leads to increase in uh, hdl cholesterol uh however i mean for increase in hdl cholesterol you need to have a vigorous exercise and along with that uh, it also helps in decreasing triglycerides and then with the, with a the diet there is a lot of debate there are lots of pros and cons we have high complex uh, carbohydrate diet we have high monounsaturated fat diet low carb increased protein diet every diet has its pros and cons and but but the bottom line is that the weight, weight weight loss is very essential in almost all these patients and one of the foremost things which which needs to be kept in mind is that this diet has to be tailored according to the patient's preferences because uh, diet is only successful if it can be taken to a long term so you know, the short term weight loss or the short term adherence to these diets it it's not very meaningful it only has some advantages or it, it gives optimal outcomes once it's carried for a long period of time and this only happens if we customize the diet or tailor the diet as per the patient's needs coming to our uh, lipid lowering drugs uh, so these these are the these are the drugs most of the drugs we have covered in this table uh, statins stand uh, the, the foremost you know they are the most potent one of the most potent drugs that are available to us and we see that all of these have on these three main components uh, ldl cholesterol hdl cholesterol and triglycerides they have their own own contribution so if we talk about different classes of drugs we'll just highlight i uh, will i will talk a uh, little bit about uh, statins and just touch base the rest of the rest of the uh, rest of the drugs that 
So if we talk about statins, uh, we have a very good evidence now. And therefore, this was a uh, cholesterol treatment trialist uh, data, which was from ab uh, about 14 RCTs. And uh, it was done in about more than 18,000 patients. And what they found was that when with every 39 milligrams per deciliter reduction in LDL, the all-cause mortality, vascular mortality, and major vascular events, they all came down. And this effect was very evident, not just in the secondary prevention patients, those who already had vascular event, but also in the patients, those who had primary disease or those who were with risk factors, but not had, but, but had not sustained any, any cardiac event till that time. So we'll just highlight these two studies, which are, which were very big in size. So heart protection study was one. It was uh, done on patients who already had CV events or those who were very high risk for atherosclerotic lesions. Again, 20,000 patients, 6,000 were diabetics, two, and uh, it was <clears throat> double blind RCT and two into two design was there. Simvastatin 40 milligrams uh, versus placebo and antioxidants versus placebo. Antioxidant arm was no beneficial effects, no harmful effects. And with simvastatin, there was a very significant reduction in terms of CV events. And in diabetics, it was further enhanced. But well, interesting thing was that this reduction in CV events was irrelevant of the duration of diabetes. Both short duration and long duration almost fared equally well. And again, uh, <clears throat> it was also not dependent on your baseline A1C. The patients who had less than 7%, more than 7% tended to behave in a similar manner. And almost all other subgroups, depending on uh, you know age, sex, the presence of comorbid conditions like hypertension, renal disease, they almost, you know, we had this positive impact in all the subgroups. The CARDS trial was another big trial. And again, <clears throat> this was, yeah, this was uh, important because it, this was mainly a primary prevention study. So these patients had no evidence of clinical atherosclerosis and they were uh, put on etovastatin just 10 milligrams per day. And by putting uh, it on 10 milligram per day, there was a very significant reduction in the, in the CV events with this as well. <clears throat> so these two showed us the uh, the relevance or the benefits of putting the patients on statin and then we had this very interesting reversal trial though, though the patient number of patients was not much they studied moderate lowering burst versus the aggressive lipid lowering now this is what the norm is and what they did was they put the patients on on 80 milligrams uh, at over statin versus 40 milligrams of prevastatin and ldl levels achieved in etova arm were 79 obviously they were quite less as compared to the prevastatin arm and they studied the atheroma volume after after giving these drugs after 18 months and they did this uh, intravascular ultrasound and what they found was the atorva arm where the where the ldl had come down to less than 80 had no change in burden of atheroma in fact there was slight regression whereas in case of prevastatin there was a progression of lesion so this 50 percent reduction in ldlc ldl cholesterol levels it uh, led to a result in, um, in a way, there was a absence of progression of lesion, though in fact there was, there was mild regression. Asteroid and Saturn, they, you know, further lowered the LDL down, again with a very high doses of atovastatin and rosuvastatin, and they brought it down to even less than 70, as we can see that asteroid had 61, <clears throat> that mean LDL level. And there what they found was, when you bring down the LDL cholesterol level to less than 70, then you have the regression of lesion. So once you bring it down to less than 100, you start, uh, you know, uh, you prevent the progression of the lesion. And once you bring it down to 70, so there is almost the evidence in form of regression of lesion. Similarly, prove it and TNT, they were, they were, these were not the atheroma volume studies, but they were the outcome studies. And again, very aggressively treated patients in these in in these trials. And what they found was once you treat the patients. Uh, with, with high doses of atovastatin or, or rosuvastatin for that matter, the CV outcomes became a lot more desirable. A word about the, the impact of statins in glucose homeostasis. So they do have some adverse impact. And uh, if you take the you know study from, uh, this, this was almost from more than 9,000 patients, and they found that the risk of developing diabetes is almost increased by 10% in patients who do not have diabetes. And higher doses produce more incidence and also there is a uh, older obese category of patients those who have already have higher baseline values they are even more prone to to get diabetes with this class of drugs but if we talk about the diabetics what they found was there is a very minor or very modest elevation of a1c of just 0.12 percent higher than uh, the normal population 
which was which was clinically insignificant so once we put the patients we have seen the there's a very good clinical evidence the the efficacy of the drugs is very good so whether we should be adding other other drugs to statins to further reduce uh, cv events but difficulty is because the 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 reduction with the uh, statins has been so robust that that we need uh, very extensive very large trials to to find some additional benefit fibrates a word about them uh, they again uh, have been coming in and out so not very convincing evidence still date about the fibrates but they, we have a few few you know insights when we when we dig in these trials so one is that they they though they give heterogeneous results but in in some populations those uh, patients who have high triglycerides and low hdl fibrates tend to do well so if you if you you know uh, subgroup analysis was done so what they found was those patients who had these two this category where they uh, where there are there are increased triglycerides and decreased hdl so they tend to fare well with with this class of molecules though combining them with fibrates in most of the trials and latest one i think was a cord a cord arm where they where they added with a high dose of statin to the fibrates the overall cv outcomes were not benefited much though there was trend towards the benefit but there are two or three things which which uh, which are which need to be mentioned about this one is that they had the fibrates again have a anti inflammatory effect and they have a unique uh, effect of ppar alpha activation uh which is which which is in uh, in the atherosclerotic lesions and thus they seem to have a directly Im impacting the impacting the lesion formation and development uh, irrespective of their impact on the uh, uh triglycerides or hdl levels similarly if there was a field study it was a very big study and in which they found that again in the subgroup analysis that those patients who uh, 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 you know who, those who were put on phenofibrate <clears throat> there was there was a positive impact on on the on the eye, diabetic eye disease the laser therapy requirement was decreased the incidence of proliferative retinopathy and maculopathy was also decreased similarly in a cord study sub, uh, subgroup the progression of retinopathy was significantly lower and not just uh, retinopathy nephropathy again so it was seen in uh, similar uh, this cord study subgroup only that there was some reduction in urine albumin excretion and mainly the progression from normal uh, albumin to the microalbuminuria was decreased in this subgroup so th they some they seem to have some protection in in reducing the microvascular complications bile acid sequestrants <clears throat> again uh, they they are challenging in in sense because of their gi toxicity the dose is somewhere close to about 3.7 grams and because of their strong drug interactions uh they have to be given even 2 hours before or 4 hours 4 hours after the after the other drugs and this with the uh, in a paper, uh, patient population with diabetes and and cvd so they're already on multiple drugs becomes a very challenging drug to use but it, it and in some of the patients another disadvantage is that it increases serum triglycerides as well <clears throat> but one advantage is that there is almost 0.5% Uh, advantage of you know glycemic uh, uh, the A1C levels in patient population is already hyperglycemic. Similarly, niacin, niacin again when initially 1966, 1974 was used, uh, it it was found to reduce CV events. It was used alone, but then when it was combined with statins, AM high and HPS2 thrive, these were the two important studies. Uh, we we couldn't get much of a benefit by increasing the HDL levels, so rather. <clears throat> there was a increase in stroke in the niacin treated group in the am high study and along with it we can see that skin flushing is a very uh, you know a very famous side effect which has led to a lot of dropouts as well in these trials then there is reduced insulin sensitivity which worsens the glycemic control it also leads to increased uric acid levels in in, in many of the patients so azetamib has has made inroads of for last few years after this improve it came and in again improve it uh, this was a large trial it, uh, it had almost 30% of the patients had diabetes and what they did was they they had intensively treated uh, and you know uh, treated patients on uh, atorvastatin and they were brought down to 70 mg and by adding azetamib they brought it down to 53 mg and there was a, a significant decrease of about 6.4% in in major cv events so you, you, <clears throat> you can imagine you know once you have already at 70 
so bringing it to 53 is further giving you 6.4 percent decrease in the in the cb benefits so these effects when and subgroup analysis was done was even more pronounced in patients those who has those who had type 2 diabetes the new <clears throat> another very potent class of molecules which is pcsk9 inhibitors Fourier and odc these were the two two uh, major landmark trials again used along with statins and they are extremely potent in a sense that they bring down LDL cholesterol level by almost 60 70 percent in in few studies even 80 percent the drawback being that they are injectables extremely expensive drugs and 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 only you know uh, in patients where you can justify this cost they can be brought in but otherwise a very very useful addition uh, to to the to the armamentarium Another class we would like to mention is adding omega-3 fatty acids. Now, this has a very unique uh, place in a sense that those patients who have high trigl triglyceride levels, this is the place, this is, this is, uh, uh, you know, even using statins, if your triglycerides are more than 145, as the guidelines mentions, 145 to 499 triglycerides, and you're using the maximum tolerated dose of uh, statin, then instead of going to phenofibrate, the guidelines indicate that we should move to move to omega-3 fatty acids in very high dose though so epa dose is is almost uh, 1800 milligrams if it has to be effective and jealous and reduce it for the two trials which have which have corroborated it's 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 beneficial impact in terms of outcomes and these beneficial impacts are again not just because of of bringing down the triglycerides as we can see they're anti-inflammatory their platelet decreasing function decreasing lipid oxidation and stabilization of membranes also plays a crucial role in these patients. So when we talk about statins for diabetic dyslipidemia, so we have these, uh, uh, <clears throat> just uh, these these categories, which is a tovastatin, resvastatin, simva, and preva. We are not using India, so we'll just stick to ourselves. High intensity means forty or eighty milligrams of tovastatin, and twenty or forty milligrams of rosuvastatin, and moderate intensity is ten to twenty of atorva and five to ten of five to ten of rosuva statin and if you go by the guidelines so these are the current guidelines and as we go, if, if, if we, this, these are the ada guidelines so according to these guidelines almost all patients who are in the age group of 40 to 75 years in diabetes so moderate intensity statin therapy is indicated in those who are who are more than 75 then after a reasonable discussion and if you have you know longevity is, is is still looks good you know so then you can, we can have the discussion with the patient without much of the comorbid morbid conditions so discuss and uh, start moderate intensity statin therapy in these patients as well so if multiple risk factors or patients who are at very high risk or age is 50 to 70 then they recommend using high intensity statin therapy and if your 10 year risk which is which goes by the ASCVD score is more than 20 percent then you might add azetamibe to these these group of patients to bring down the LDL cholesterol to le less than 50 percent of their previous levels and in secondary prevention it's very straightforward that we have to be on high intensity statin, uh, statin therapy or the maximal tolerated dose and if the risk is extremely high then you consider adding azetamibe or PCSK9 inhibitor if LDL levels are still more than 70 milligrams per deciliter. NLA, this is again, they, they, they should have to conclude fast. Yeah, just, just to three or four. Yeah, yeah. So LDL call, uh, National Lipid Association says that your you, it also brings down on non-HDL part and says that if your patient is high risk, non-HDL has to be less than 100, LDL has to be less than 70. Similarly, low risk, so LDL has to be less than 100 and, and HDL has to be less than less than 130. Similarly, ACE guidelines, they, they categorize into these three categories, extreme risk, very high risk and high risk, and they bring an, along APOB as well. So they want 70, 80 and 90 is the, is the limits in extreme, very high and high risk for APOB. Similarly, I, we have these uh, uh, dys dyslipidemia recommendation in our RSS uh, DI guidelines, where they also mention about <clears throat> bempedoic acid and Seroglitazar uh, in patients, especially in, in those who have hypertriglyceridemia. And bempedoic acid, those who cannot tolerate statins or they where we further bring, want to bring it down to less than 55 in few of the cases. So to, first of all, we need to address the LDL levels to bring down to the goal. We have a very strong database now, which says that, you know, we, uh, which uh, links this uh, lowering of LDL with, with the reduction in CV outcomes. 
first choice of course in lowering ldl is statins um, then we have uh, intensive statin therapy where we have amazing evidence in terms of bringing down the bringing down the event rates in in patients who are high risk or those who have ascvd and if even if uh, you know when we are using the maximum dose of statin or maximum tolerated dose of statin we are not reaching the goal uh, ldl levels or we desire that the patient is very high risk that it has to be on lowest possible ldl levels so acid azetamibe along with the pcsk9 inhibitors are, are the drugs which are available to us for that so as a second choice drug is azetamibe or pcsk9 bile acid sequestrants and pempicoic uh, acid again pempitoic acid they have they are the alternatives but not much used in clinical practice maybe pempitoic acid will be uh, in the in the coming years an interesting part is all these molecules whether whether azetamibe pcsk9 bile acid sequestrants and pempitoic they they act additively in lowering the ldl cholesterol con, uh, concentration because they they increase the uh, ldl receptors by very different mechanisms so they have a very additive effect once you add second priority has to be non hdl cholesterol again uh, we know that total cholesterol minus hdl is non hdl and it is a measure of all pro atherogenic apolipo uh, apolipoprotein b containing particles and various studies have now linked have shown that non hdl is a is a strong risk factor for cvd in fact we had uh, one study in our own hospital as well which was uh, in our unit i did with dr rajiv chawla dr ashwin did it i think in our unit and triglycerides uh, if controlling about this so glycemic control becomes very important because uh, uh, once we control blood glucose levels triglycerides fall in place lifestyle changes especially the decrease in ethanol intake if it is there decrease sugar levels and once you cannot get the desirable level in spite of using statins and uh, triglycerides high omega 3 fatty acids are the drug of choice but in selective patient population we can also think about fibrates where triglycerides on a higher side hdl is on a lower side as it has added benefit of reducing microvascular complications and hdl uh, very strong data which links low hdl with cvd but not much of a data showing that increasing hdlc with pharmacological drugs is of any value thank you so much